started. As you know, the Farm Talks Department prides itself on its curriculum. And the reason we can offer such a diverse and outstanding curriculum is because we bring in experts from the community. And Dr. Brian Luke is no exception. Uh, he spent 30 years uh, in the Army, 20 years in the Army as a uh, Army Colonel. And in, in fact, just last summer, we were up at Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland. He's like, yeah, I was stationed there as a captain. I was there as a major, there as a lieutenant colonel. None of those stations were uh, consecutive. So he was like, leave, go back. And this is at um, the Medical Institute of Chemical Defense, US Army. And so again, expert in this field. He has over 30 publications. He has tech reports. I, he has a co-author on a patent. And I know he just finished a book because he's been editing it quite, quite a lot. <laughs> and he has over 60 global experts in chem defense in this book. I think I'm the last chapter. So we need to discuss that. And, and so it, People remember the last chapter. Yes, I know. I actually felt like it was a really good place. Um, so he, I actually met him about six years ago, stepped over the department, we've kept in touch. Um, Sabir, I think, was actually the one that introduced us. And then over the past couple years, I've had the good fortune to work with him over at the toxicology branch in the Air Force um, at Bright Pat, and we've been working on a DOD project. And I witnessed him be a mentor, not just to the new lieutenants and the, and the others coming in, but basically everybody in the branch, myself included. And so he's, a, he's an excellent leader, he's an expert, and in an area that's near and dear to my heart and to some of yours. So I would like to now give him the opportunity to talk, which I rarely do. So, thank Brian Luthi, Dr. Luthi. Thank you, Terry, and thank you, Jeff. I appreciate actually everybody coming here. Um, I, I gave a presentation like this uh, several years back when, when the events first occurred in Syria. Uh, I was partially involved primarily because part of my, ex can, you, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I, I, like uh, Terry said, I used to run the Institute of Chemical Defense and um, they, they consulted me in some of the issues that were going on when uh, some of the events first occurred in Syria. So I gave this presentation once before and I've sort of updated it. The focus is chem warfare. And, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about this, but uh, there are a lot of bad things that are going on in Syria. I'm not downplaying that at all. It's, it's horrible. Uh, nevertheless, I'm going to focus on the Kim warfare. And what I'd like to do is have you think about, try to put yourself back at that time, at that moment, and think if you were certain people, responders, the president, what would you do? So she was going to, oh, you were going to flip this for me? <laughs> Good. Okay, first, uh, first thing, disclaimer, you know, my opinions are my opinions, not that of the government. And uh, all the information that I have in here is unclassified, well, all the information I have in here was in the news media. Um, when I left the Institute of Chemical Defense, I wasn't uh, involved with the classified part. And the weird thing about classification is sometimes information is in the news media that's classified that you don't know it's classified unless you know it's classified. <laughs> All I'm saying is everything that I saw is in the news media, okay? Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and again, what I'd like for you to do is, as I talk about this and, and show you certain events that have occurred throughout uh, all of this, the uprising, think about a couple things. Think about how they managed the crisis. If you were there, and you well could be there. I mean, they say it's not a question of if we're going to have a chemical warfare attack here in the United States. It's when and where. Um, so think about if you're there, how would you respond? And then think about what we would need to do to improve the situation for us to respond better. And then also try to understand all the politics involved with the scenarios. Um, I do want to say, okay, when I prepared this, uh, I, I captured a bunch of videos. And as I was capturing a video, I'd capture a link. And then I'd go back to it two or three days later and that link would be gone. And then I'd have to find another link. And the reason why I say that, it was some of these videos are horrible. And for like two or three months, I was just, I was trying to 
captured these links. It was like playing with my mind. Um, if these, the pictures are bad, so if you have any problem with them, I have absolutely no problem with you either closing your eyes or getting up and leaving. Seriously, that's all right, because it is, it's horrible. Um, okay, so the Syrian civil war started back in March of 2011. Think about that time. Um, there, there was the Arab uprising. There was, uh, what was it, Tuni the, the Burning Man in Tunisia really started it. And then, uh, what was it, Egypt, Algeria, Libya, Yemen, Jordan, were all um, rebelling, and a lot of them were toppling the governments. So it was a time when there was a lot of uprising going on. A small group, it, there was a drought, and farmers were coming into the city, and there was a small group of boys down in the southern part of Dara that ended up writing some graffiti on one of the walls, anti-government. What the military police did is they captured the boys and tortured them. A few days later, or actually, you know, it was sort of immediately, the, that community rebelled and they protested. And the military came in hard. They killed dozens of people and I think seven military police officers were killed. Uh, after that, the uprising started occurring all throughout the whole country. And so it was really, at that time, it was a sort of a Sunni-dominated group against the Shia, the government. Bashar al-Assad, right? Next slide. Jump up today, and this is where I'm saying, you know, the, the, it's horrible events that have occurred. Over uh, half a million people have died. Uh, about more than five and a half million have fled the country. And another six million have left their homes. So horrible, horrible situations. Uh, most of it does not involve chemical warfare. And I'm not, again, I'm not downplaying that. I just want to, I'm focusing on the chemical warfare. I want you to think about that aspect. Next slide, please. Okay, so at this time, what's U.S. thinking? We're in Iraq and Afghanistan. The war's gone way too long. We want to get out. Americans are not supportive of another war. And a lot of countries in the world opinion is that we're the bully. You know, one country called us the world's half-blind bully. So we're very apprehensive about participating in this, especially since we are seeing the Mideast, we're seeing a lot of these governments being toppled, so things are working out on their own. So we think, you know, let's stand back on this and let this work out themselves. But we are concerned about the unconventional weapons, getting the wrong hands, chemical warfare agents. Next slide. So we, we wait a little bit and a bunch of players start changing. So the government has the Syrian army, they have Bashar al-Assad's army, uh, Iran sends in troops, and Hezbollah. On the opposition side, we got Islamic Front, and that's just a, it's a motley group, really, of, of different um, small little areas forming their own war fighting efforts. Um, all have different opinions of what they want to accomplish. Some, in the Syrian uh, army, some of those people defect and form the Free Syrian Army. And that group really tries to organize the opposition overall, but it's still so many different small players, it's very challenging for them to organize. Uh, then you have al-Nusra, which is an al-Qaeda faction. And then we go down and, and you see ISIS. At this time, the United States didn't, we as a group, didn't really recognize ISIS much. We didn't really understand what their power was and how great they were um, in influencing situations. So they were on the opposition side fighting the government, but they had different opinions, pretty strong different opinions than the rest of their partners. So it was sort of the enemy, my enemy is my friend, but they weren't really friends with them, okay? And then we had the Kurds. So really four major groups, next slide. So we start watching, we've seen that the regime and the rebels both have terrorist groups. If we were to help either group, it could backfire against us because weapons would get in the wrong hands. So we're trying to politically posture ourselves for the best outcome. Again, we're very concerned with this effort. I'm, I'm just talking about chemical warfare. We're very concerned about these weapons getting in the wrong hands. Next slide. 
So what do we know at the time, actually? What do we suspect at the time? And I think that you know, Intel is pretty good. We got a pointer here? Yeah. All right, you got to be smarter than the thing here. All right, good. So if you look, there is production facilities. There was one up here at Alapo, one over, we, we suspected one over here, one in Hama, and one in Homs. So four of them. And then there was um, storage sites also outside that, one little down here and one over in here, okay? But at that time, to August 2012, there was major fighting, and you know, it's, it was pretty much all over, but there were major fighting areas, major conflicts here and here and here and here, Damascus. Next slide. So why is Syria, or why does Syria have chemical weapons? Back in uh, 1967, 73, and 82, they were defeated um, d d uh, disastrously with Israel. They, d they destroyed them. Um, is they recognize Israel has definitely a superior conventional military. So they were seeking an unfair advantage, and that's why they went to chemical warfare weapons. Uh, Egypt helped out. Egypt gave them artillery shells. Uh, Russia and China gave them some technology and equipment. And Iran actually helped fund it and helped uh, build production facilities. Next slide. And Syria became one of the most advanced chemical warfare uh, countries in the whole Mideast. So we knew at that time that they were developing, producing, and storing the weapons, that they had production facilities to make more, and that they had the missiles and artillery shells, rockets to deliver it. Next slide. And this gives you an example. A lot of their, the, the weapons that they had stored, they were called binary. So it was like two components. This is a safe component here, which is isopropyl alcohol. And this one here is methyl phosphonyl difluoride, which is when these two are, when it's exploded, they mix together and they form sarin gas. Next slide. Okay, so I remember at this time, we're watching the scenarios, and I, I remember the, the news was interviewing a lot of the different commanders, the rebels. And the rebels, they were pretty warm beaten, um, war beaten. They, they were they were fighting hard. They did not have the weapons. They didn't have the, the troops that the government did. But they were really fighting hard. And the interviews, I remember this one guy, he was a commander, and he, he was saying, you know, what is going on with the international community? Why isn't anybody helping us? We're doing everything we can. We're winning these battles. We have our heart into this. Somebody come here and help us and then pointed at United States in particular. Um, so that's the scenario is that these rebels are really, at that time, looking for international support. They're publishing um, all the war atrocities that is occurring. And, um, but there also is this group, it's a very diverse group, they're getting more and more diverse in their beliefs. So especially like the ISIS had their own approach to what the rest of the opposition uh, had. Next slide. So the international community becomes very, is getting very concerned and they're really concerned about chemical warfare. And I don't know exactly what happened behind the scenes in that, but it became apparent that the uh, international community was talking to the, to the government saying, better not have any chemical warfare weapons used. So the, uh, the prime minister, or the uh, foreign minister, the Syria's foreign minister came out in uh, July 2012 and he states Syria would never use any chemical or biological weapons inside Syria. And not only that, we have all the weapons stored secretly and securely. Next slide. Two days later they say, well, I hope you didn't misinterpret what we said. We really don't have any chemical weapons. <laughs> I, the, the PR, I don't know who was doing the, 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 you know, the relationships on this. It, it, some of the things that they actually say are just so crazy that you wonder why would they even go there? Next slide. Okay, 
Uh, so a month later, President Obama says the red line. You guys remember the red line? Says, a red line for us, if we start seeing a whole bunch of chemical weapons moving around or being utilized. UK and France echo the same sentiments. If you guys have any questions at any time, please interrupt me. Next slide. So a month or two later, we get intelligence that and, and documented pictures of soldiers mixing the precursors, preparing it for chemical weapons, and loading equipment for transportation. And uh, so it, it's leaked, it was some, somehow leaked from Syria, and it showed that Syria is being assisted uh, by Iran, right? So they're moving it. The red line says if you move it or if you use it, right? Next slide. So when President Obama says, uh, okay, well, if you use chemical weapons now, right? That's going to be the red line for us. It's going to be totally unacceptable, and there will be consequences. So I want you to put yourself in the president's position right now, too. Back then, you know, he made that statement, but what would you have done if you were the president? Again, the United States is considered the bully. We go in and we, we interfere in situations, people say, that we should not. Nothing really has occurred in chemical warfare area yet. Should he have gone in? I mean, what would you have done? Just think about that. I'm not saying one, an one answer is right or wrong. It's a lot easier nowadays to say, why didn't he do that? You know, this, this would have eliminated a lot of problems. But at that moment, at that time, things were different. Next slide. Okay. So I, I, do, I remember this very clearly, this scenario. And uh, the, it said, the headlines said, Syria chemical weapons are secured for now, December 22nd, uh, 2012. And what happened was it says th these are the free Syrian army, they're on their tanks, they're posing that they uh, took command of the area right where in Hama where those weapons are being secured. So uh, a bit of information for you. The people that write headlines are not the people that write the article, and it doesn't really have to totally match. In this scenario, I, I thought, well, I have a problem with this. Does anybody in here have a problem with this? So you, you know there's four sites, right, that weapons are being produced and stored in. They control this, and now we say the weapons are secured, and then for now, I mean, for now, obviously, it could change any time. So the guy who wrote the article was actually interviewing an a, uh, Israeli uh, intel person, and he's the one who said, <coughs> yeah, for now. I mean, he made it point, just for now. I mean, it could change any time, but for now, we got this one site taken care of. But when the news came out, everybody was talking about this. And I remember in the United States, it, it was like, oh, thank God, you know, this is wonderful. We, we have this under control. Next slide. Okay, uh, the next day, very next day, can you click that, uh, that, let's see if we go right up here and do this. Okay, this, I'm just gonna prepare you. This is a video, so this is a, one of the videos that I dislike, but nevertheless, oops. I wonder how we can see that on there. Here, let's try this. At the end, is the, uh, anybody in here who knows how to make the video on this screen on here? <coughs> can we like, move it over? Oh, there you go. How'd you do that? Okay, so you see that, um, <laughs> can you play it again? I, well, that part I'm not sure. Right, oh, you almost got it. Can you yeah, see that I, or not? I do not see go, Okay, right there, now go over to, okay, yeah, perfect. All right, so, you see a video of a person. Notice he's partially clothed. 
Notice the people in the background. Um, some may have gloves on that are, you know, like surgical gloves, some don't. Um, and you, you see that he's, he may be tearing there, possibly, possibly some salvation, you know, um, in his mouth and that, right? This is the symptom. This, so this is what you see. This is it. Horrible, horrible. But, um, okay, close that. There you go. Okay, so this happened in Homs, a little bit uh, south. And um, the opposition forces claim that Syria launched a bomb with poisonous gas. About six or seven rebels were killed. <coughs> Seventy were hurt. <coughs> okay, you're the President of the United States. What do you do? Do you know this chemical warfare? Next slide. This gentleman was apparently involved. He's a senior general in the uh, government army. Defects over because he's very angry. And he says chemical weapons were used. Um, yeah, Syrian military defector. And it was nerve gas. <coughs> He was very angry. He said that uh, you know, he doesn't want to be a part of the government's efforts in attacking their own people. Next slide. OK. Um, so the Syrian medical group ends up telling us that they, they treated patients at the field hospital. And here's what they were seeing. They saw a white gas with odor, headaches, Shortness of breath, loss of vision, inability to speak, flushed face, paralysis, nausea, vomiting, bronchiospasms. These symptoms are, are pretty generalized symptoms. They really don't tell you specifically. Could be chemical warfare. I mean, it could be nerve agent. It could be a variety of different things. Definitely something bad, but you, it's not definitive. Okay, but look at this. Pinpoint pupils and increased respiratory secretions. You, how many people are studying chemical warfare agents in here? Okay, just, okay, so. With, with that, do you have an idea? What would cause pinpoint pupil? What's that? Colon esterase. Colon inhibitors, nerve agents, right? Okay, but other stuff would too. But nevertheless, if it was chemical warfare agent, nerve agent, it would be consistent with this, okay? <coughs> So it is, um, <clears throat> it's a cholinergic, right? Is it, can we say it's CWA though? I mean, Obama said, if you use CWA, we're, we're coming in. Well, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit. When I finish with this, I'll show you what the definition of CWA is. Classic, go ahead. <laughs> Very, it, very, it's a very good question, right? So you're in, in it's called the fog of war. It, things are, bombs are going off everywhere, right? <laughs> they can explode it with other stuff. They can have all kinds. So I wouldn't rely, I think, I, actually, I meant to discuss, I wouldn't rely on this. And in fact, I, you know, when we say you smell something, you smell something odorless, I mean, you know, what, what does that mean? Even, even if you smell, you know, like, hay or something that identifies some agent. It might be a little too late if you're smelling it. Um, but I, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't mess with that. So <clears throat> the Physicians for Human Rights uh, called me. This is a group, international group, that help physicians throughout the whole world. And they wanted to develop a protocol for the, the physicians that were over there and help them identify the best way to treat. So um, what we did, what I actually, I ended up looking at their, their policies. The Institute of Chemical Defense, where I used to work, teaches the way to really manage chemical casualties. So I looked at what they had, and they, their, their, some of their, <laughs> their advice was wrong. Um, we, we fixed that, we, we sent this over, and they translated it into their language. Um, but, you know, you, you saw that. Again, you could be in this situation. Something could happen. How would you respond? And then what would you do as a president right now? <clears throat> Next slide. So, 
gosh, I love this. This is like, I can still clearly remember, I'm looking at all this, right? right? Ner nerve agent, right? Huh? We say, we, I mean, we just, the news headlines come out, Syria drops an hallucinogenic weapon on the rebels. And they say, it's, we got intel, and it's Agent 15. They called it BZ, but it's a BZ, BZ-like chemical. BZ is a, um, they say, an unidentified contact makes a very compelling case that it was BZ against the opposition forces in Homs. <laughs> BZ is an anticholinergic. It causes the dryness, dilated pupil. It causes dryness of the mouth, sort of a, a hallucinogen type. <laughs> so, like, you're trying to get this story straight, but I mean, it, it just is all messed up at that time. Next slide. I call my buddy, John, Jonathan Newmark. He's, uh, he works at the Institute of Chemical Defense, and he really teaches some of the class. I said, John, am I, am I, am I missing something here? What, you know, we're, they're asking me my opinion. I, I would never have said BZ. And he said, uh, you know, he looked at the YouTube videos, and they didn't see any evidence it was BZ. Same, same conclusion that, uh, you know, there was tearing and salvation, and, and it's, this BZ is an anticholinergic that makes people dry. So um, we can't conclude anything. So you're trying to decide at this moment what agent is used, whether it's really chemical warfare or not, and this is what's coming out in the, in the news now. Next slide. So what's the U.S. decide to do? I mean, we, we put up some sanctions to that, but for the most part, we, um, we say that, well, there's really no evidence that it's chemical warfare agent. I, at the end of this, remind me, because when I conclude, I have in the backup a definition of chemical warfare agent. And you'll see it's sort of questionable. I mean, almost any toxic agent used to kill people is considered a warfare agent. But when you think of chemical warfare agent, most people think of sarin or nerve gases or mustard or something of that thing. Okay, and then there's also a doctor who had treated, claimed to have treated 30 of the 100 people. And he said it was not GB, it was not sarin or, or um, Agent 15. I don't know why he says that. But, you know, we're, this is at wartime. It's very hard to get anything definitive from people that are in these type of scenarios. Next slide. Okay, February um, 2013, another incident occurred. And I had the video for this and it, got, it, it disappeared and I was never able to get it before. <coughs> But what you see is people coming in this place and they, they look like they're drunk, they're, they're hallucinating, their hands are flying like this, they're walking around aimlessly, um, slurred speech, um, no fluid secretions, okay? Dry, in fact, dry mouth. <clears throat> and the government, so claim it was another attack, 2013. The government says, my third grade daughter could act better. You know, that was their stance. This is, this is all an act, right? But now, in reality, an hallucinogen is going to cause this. I mean, if, it would, if they were exposed to something like and some sort of hallucinogen, you'd be doing exactly this. Right? <clears throat> and it does look like somebody's acting. It looks like they're, they're out of their mind type thing. Um, so what's the news agents say? <laughs> the news media? They say, it's a nerve agent attack. Jim, what do you think about that? Huh? It's, not adding up. It's, it's totally backwards. I mean, now I think it's Agent 15, and they say it's a nerve agent attack. Um, next slide, please. Okay, I got another, so this is another video I was able to capture. You want to see if you can do this again? Sure. March, so March, a month later, <clears throat> Man, you're getting good. Okay. <laughs> now the Syrian government is saying this. This morning a missile was launched. And this is, this is pro-government. Pro and it fell, it fell nor in Aleppo. The missile carried poisonous gas. Up to this moment, we have 16 martyrs, 86 injured, most of them in critical condition. The substance of the missile caused immediate fainting, convulsions, and death. 
you all know that using this type of weapon is prohibited against the rules of international law. This is a government saying this, the government. In all international resolutions and conventions. So they're blaming the rebels. Now the Free Syrian Army posts this video saying, hey, we didn't do it. Of course, you know, again, that's one faction of the whole opposition, but that's what happened. <clears throat> so it ended up um, 16 government soldiers were killed, 10 civilians were killed, and there were more than 100 that were injured. And, and both of them blamed each other. But there's not just two sides. Say again? There's not just two sides. Right. There, both of them said we didn't do it, but there's another side. There's uh, many like military sides, and they they had the power. They still uh, maybe they stole some weapons or something. Um, yeah. No. No. I, I, so. so <coughs> yeah, yeah. Right. So I mean, you know, that's so. This is the situation. Who did it? Who did it? We said we were going to attack, really, the government if the government did it. We really didn't talk about the rebels. We, we didn't communicate to them, although the same message should have applied. But we were going after Bashar al-Assad at the time. So you're the government. What do you, you're the United States. What do you do at the time? You're the president. Assad actually, he ended up requesting the United Nations, it was very clever on his part, he ended up requesting the United Nations to come in, said this is totally unacceptable, they're using chemical weapons against me, and uh, so the United Nations send, uh, end up sending this gentleman who's from the Organization for, for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, and they're going to <coughs> do a fact-finding mission, right? It was back in March, 2013. Next slide. And then the the side, when they get there, and the side says, well, I'm not going to let you go in the area. <laughs> Deny them access. Next slide. So France, and actually I have to say, the French were probably, of all the countries, they were probably the most supportive of entering in and helping the opposition force of any country, including the United States. Somehow, <clears throat> and you know, you, you can read, I, the information that somehow they, they got samples. Here, I mean, imagine this, you want to go in and you want to test samples, but there's a war going on. And there's several factions that want the outcome to be favorable for them. So you can't just get samples from anybody. You have to have a proper chain of custody. You have to have somebody go in who's very reputable, collect a sample, bring it back to you to analyze, right? <coughs> Somehow the French do that. They get proper samples and they confirm that serum was used several times. And they said it's unacceptable that these crimes be unpunished. They were, they were really pro, you know, moving in. Um, <clears throat> so the United States, their response is, well, I think we still need some more work to determine who is responsible for this. So now both sides have been really attacked. Yeah. Go ahead. When, I mean, when you do take the fight normally, sometimes you do a blind double, like you don't know where you're getting the sample from. So in this case, when they go into this, they get some from the market, one from uh, the United States, blindly looking for the evidence of these areas, or they do it? So that's a great question. So what he's saying is the people that analyze at the laboratory usually get blind samples. They don't know really where it came from. And they, and they have different samples, some are positive, some are negative, and then, the, then the, the true one that you're analyzing you don't know. And his question is, well, where do these come from then? It was war. We don't know. All we know is the French said they went in there, they got some valid samples from somebody they trust. And I think what it was, I think they sent this, their, their special ops team in. And they went in, collected them themselves, and left. That's what I believe. Uh, they didn't say. A very good question. Okay, <clears throat> next slide, please. Okay, I found it, it was very interesting at the time. I was part of, um, I was following social media, and we were part of a group that had uh, subject matter experts. And there were quite a few different people that had 
different opinions in there. Was, and I highly encourage you when these type of events occur to join some group like that and just see what people are thinking, especially a, I think this was through LinkedIn, and it was a, uh, it was a very intelligent group that knew what they were talking about. Um, and in particular, like this, I just captured one, just to give you an example. Um, what this gentleman here says is that, you know, there's a many atrocities that have occurred, and most people assume is a government. It was Saren. Uh, he says there's a good chance, no real evidence, that al Nusra uh, or some other insurgent may have employed chemical weapons. Because remember, they're trying to draw the United States in. They want us to participate. So this Al-Qaeda faction, uh, we found that they were caught in Turkey with sarin canisters. So he's saying, you know, we need to stop jumping to the conclusion that it was automatically the government. Next slide. Yes. Say again. Okay. I don't have here. They wanted to attract the United States to is the, the, the rebels they wanted to help the, or something? Else? The rebels, so, you know, part of the rebels, I mean, some of the rebels hated us. That's why. Right? Because it's such uh, a right. that are doing good. Yes, especially like ISIS. ISIS cannot stand United States. I mean, everybody knows that, right? Um, nevertheless, would it be nice if we helped them destroy the government so it make their life easier to take over? I mean, that's sort of part of their, their thinking. Uh, at least that's what, you know, we're seeing here. So, I, um, yes? What it, what really matters is like saving the people, the population, rather than supporting white, let's say, the government or ISIS or anything. Like, what I guess if I was the president, if I were the president, uh, I would care about the people themselves, regardless which, like, direction I would go with or which, like, side. But I need to save the people because you see the videos and how people they suffer. So I guess United States should consider that maybe. Yeah, so, I mean, and, I, and you're absolutely right. So the question was, why didn't the United States really consider the people, not one side or the other? And, and I think, again, you have to be back at that time when you're in that situation. The United States is not seen favorably by any country. Um, we, we did, I'm just showing you the chemical warfare aspects. There were things that we did. Uh, you know, we put, imposed sanctions. We tried to help a bit on the sideline but we did not go in immediately. Again, right now, we're not really even sure what the heck's going on. You see the, the government people get exposed to gas. You see the rebels get exposed to gas. And how do you help in that situation? Uh, and it's war. So um, August, so, so it's like, what is this? Is it March? So I think like five months later, Assad, tells the UN, hey, you know what, I, I think I do want you back here. I want you to do an inspection again, All right? And um, we're gonna let you look at, and he, very specifically, we're gonna let you look at three sites. You collect samples how you want. So this team, the OPC, the Organization for Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, come to Damascus, they're staying there, they're trying to work out the details. Again, they, they are going into a war zone, so, they're looking at best protecting all these people to go in, take the samples, uh, evaluate. Next slide. While they're there, while they're sleeping in the hotels in Damascus, another event occurs in Damascus. Uh, let's, can you, this is horrible. This, this like is just terrible. You see the twitching? Rick Morris, right? They're, what they're shown is the pinpoint pupil salivating. And dead, many dead, many dead. It's horrible. All right. So now um, the treating physicians saw meiosis, pinpoint pupil, they saw that muscle contractions in that. Um, Jim, what do you think? That, 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 looks like that looks like nerve agent. I mean, it's nerve agent blocks acetylcholinesterase so that your acetylcholine stays uh, around, and so you just 
your, your muscles twitch, and then, you know, they, first of all, they contract, they're just like, and then they start twitching, and you start having secretions into your lungs, uh, mouth, eyes, et cetera, runny nose. Um, there are hundreds of videos of this. And uh, next slide, please. So the Syrian, <laughs> I don't know where they did. The Syrian government claims it was all made up. This whole thing was made, hundreds of videos. I, I don't know why they would even go there. It, you lose all credibility. Uh, but I remember look, reading this myself. I'm sure you guys probably remember this scenario. I, I'm looking at this thing. The government brought these inspectors here. The inspectors are a few miles from this site and this occurred? Would the government be that stupid to do this while the inspectors are here? So I was really scratching my head on that one. <coughs> um, the opposition, of course, you know, throw more complication into it. Opposition says, Agent 15. <laughs> what the heck? Where are they getting this? It's definitely not Agent 15. <coughs> Russia says, the foreign minister of Russia says it was the rebels. The rebels did this to themselves. And then Putin says, there's no evidence that even occurred. So it's like, it was, I, I mean, I'm not sure if you guys remember this. I'm thinking, what is going on? If they're really trying to gain some credibility, to say it never even occurred, I lost a lot of respect for Putin, at least with his sincerity. Okay, next slide. So, 30 August, a few days later, after Russia said it didn't occur, I mean, Putin said it didn't occur. Um, the news media, Voice of Russia, Iran Post, and um, Syrian president on YouTube, says <coughs> they found some rebels that claim that it was them. They did it. The rebels did it. They got it from, um, from where was it, the, Saudi, the Saudis. And they didn't know what it was. They weren't trained on how to use it and they, it was really meant for the Al-Qaeda, but they got it instead and they used it. <clears throat> okay, so if you think about that, I actually I thought, is that possible? Is it possible that somebody, rebels would have it by accident? Well, there is a lot of chaos there, a lot of weapons being changed. Maybe that's possible. Yeah, I think that that might be a, a good possibility. But rebels, do you think there's any rebel who's going to be standing up for the government, trying to go for the cause of the government, that would come out and say, yes, I did it, don't blame the government? That part makes no sense. Right? Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. So, um, yeah. It's, I mean, it's a, it's a great excuse. I mean, that's what they should have, if they're really coming up with false excuses, that's what they should have said in the very beginning. But they probably should have had some independent news media go in and, but there's no rebel that's going to say that. I mean, even if they're really upset, the rebels, they, I remember the guy, one of the guys that being interviewed, he didn't seem too upset. If he just killed hundreds of his own people, he'd be, you know, he wouldn't be able to be composed. Next slide. Um, my good buddy, Eric Eisencraft sort of wrote this paper. And what he did, he looked at the hundreds of the videos and they looked at um, the scenarios and, and, and the symptoms and everything. It's very, very well written. If you get a chance, if you're interested in this subject, I highly recommend you look this thing up. And it talks about not only how they determined that from their observations that it's very likely it was nerve agent, but some of the things that they did wrong and, and, and situations that you could do if this would ever happen again. So it's, he's a medical doctor, he's very, very well published. Next slide. So 28, 30 August, 13, it gets really intense. The United States finally says the Assad regime conducted this attack and we're going in. President Obama is pushing for strikes. 60% of Americans still don't want to get involved in the war. We've been in enough wars, we have bad reputation, let's let them work it out themselves. Even though 80% believe that Assad uses weapons. 
The British, um, <coughs> British Parliament, actually, so the UK Prime Minister actually is recommending the UN come in. Let's, let's form UN uh, troop, UN uh, collaboration, and, and move in and get in Syria. But the British Parliament rejects UK's involvement. So Obama's seeking congressional approval at this time for us to unilaterally go in and help out. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> right before we gave a deadline, he sent Secretary of State uh, John Kerry over, and he told Syria, we didn't expect this, you know, them, them to do anything, but he said, okay, your last chance. Syria, you need to turn up or all your chemical weapons or we're moving in immediately. So Russia, uh, I don't know how they end up being the good guys in this, but they appear to be the good guys. We're going to broker the deal. Okay, how about this? How about if we have all the Syrian chemical weapons under international control, will you promise not to conduct military strikes? And because Kerry actually said this in the beginning, he said, well, yeah, okay, let's, let's do that. So US, UK, and France all agree. Next slide. <coughs> Russia, I mean, uh, Syria now claims the stockpile of weapons that they didn't have any of, right? <laughs> that back then, you misunderstood us. We don't have any weapons. Um, 1,300 tons, tons. 23 different sites, 23. So, um, <coughs> We start destroying it. I mean, they start destroying the plants right away, the, uh, production plants. And um, this, this, was, this was very interesting. So now imagine 23 sites, you got a war going on, everybody's shooting each other at the sites where these weapons are, and we want to try to get them out. We want to try to destroy them. This is a major challenge. In addition, how are you going to get them out? You know, we're talking about sending them up north. Let's go bring them up through Europe. No country wants any weapons going through their country, right? So a lot of different protests, and it's like, it's craziness of this. So what they end up doing, they end up talking about us moving up north. Um, gosh, I think it was like, a, I don't know. You never know with intel whether somebody just put that out or whether it was just totally false information somebody made up but they said they were going to transport it up north all a bunch of protesters and everybody was protesting that approach and they brought it down south real fast out to the mediterranean sea and they brought a ship in the united states had a ship um, it was called cape ray and they transported the stuff through the mediterranean sea out to the ship and they destroyed uh, most of the agent that way. Next slide. Okay. 93% of the agent is destroyed back in 20, uh, 23 April 14. 90, 93%. And this happens. If you click another slide. As chlorine gas, we were able to determine this uh, quickly. Somebody had monitors, they measured it, or measured the uh, Analyzed the gas. They determined it was chlorine gas. Work. That's not going to work. Okay. So, um, same type of horrible scenarios. You know, it, it's just uh, people dying from chlorine gas. Uh, yeah. But, again, you're you're the president of the United States. What do you do? We know that this was an attack. We know it was chlorine gas. Is that considered a chemical weapon? Well, it's not the nerve agent or the mustard, but it is one of the agents they used in World War I that they developed the Geneva Protocol against. So <laughs> we essentially did, you know, we, the, the concern, I, and I remember very specifically when this happened, I thought, oh man, what are they going to do? We got to get rid of this. And if we, if we do something too stupid that's going to inhibit, stop this, we're going to have a problem, but, um, you know, you can't just let it go. But nevertheless, that, the situation was we sort of ignored that, and then 23 June 2014, the last of the weapons were shipped out. 
Um, and then in August, this was, 40 something days, they destroyed an unbelievable amount of chemical weapons. It was, it's unheard of. But in August 18, all the weapons that were shipped off were destroyed. That Syria claimed that they hit. Next slide. So um, Israel, in October, 1st of October, said the Assad attains um, a secret cache of chemical weapons. And they claim it's a few tons of sarin. Which, you know, do, do we know that or not? I mean, it, it makes, quite honestly, it makes a lot of sense. They developed the chemical weapons to protect themselves from Israel. And they still want to have some sort of unfair advantage. Why would they give up everything? But I don't know. I mean, this, this, you don't know where it is or anything. Next slide. Um, okay, next slide. Last year, I'm not sure. Let's don't show any more slides. I, these videos, I mean, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> I wanted to give this presentation, but it's horrible. And especially when you have to keep on looking at these videos again and again, it just it plays with your mind. It's, um, April uh, 4th, 2017, there was another attack in a rebel town. The Russians claim that gas was released um, by them, by the Syrian government, bombing the terrorists that had gas. And then the activists say that Syria carried it out. It was a targeted attack. Okay, now, next slide. Uh, this is back, I remember this, because United States, um, you know, uh, Trump was sort of saying, oh man, you guys screwed up, right? And uh, Rush says, you better not interfere. If you interfere, we're gonna uh, consider this declaration of war and we're gonna be involved in, well, a couple days later, uh, actually, Trump said, Russia, it's your fault. You're supposed to broker this deal. They're not supposed to have any more left. We're going in. And so they did, and they, they, they did 59 Tomahawk cruise missiles at air base where those were planes that carried the chemical weapons, supposedly carried them, were. So that was the response. Next slide. A year later, helicopters dropped bombs again. Toxic uh, gas in a rebel-held town. Sarah, we believe, was Sarah again, right? Um, World Health Organization say about 500 people may have been uh, affected. Next slide. Same type of thing. Um, Russia, you better not interfere. We're going to be at war with you. And um, we end up attacking Fr United States, France, and the United Kingdom launch airstrikes in the eastern town of Buda. Next slide. So where are we today? This is what the scenario looks like. This is a really cool website. There's, um, you go in there, you look at the map, and it's actually an updated map of where conflict is actually occurring. So just to give you an update, this is the government. Government's actually, you know, it, it keeps, it shrinks and expands the, these different uh, areas, but the government owns this. Opposition forces um, excluding ISIS are here, and the Kurds in here. And this, if you click on these things, it shows you the actual, there's actual battles going on right here. It shows you things that are being transported. Um, they just shot down, a, right, I'm sure if you guys read this. The, uh, the Syrian government shot down a Russian plane just recently. I think they thought it was an Israeli plane. I think that's for something, yeah. But they shot down a Russian plane. And it, it's got, if you, if you click on this, it, it talks right about it, you know. Um, and here, this is, um, this is a phone call. Putin is talking to Netanyahu. And it's got, it said, you know, I just did this yesterday. It said in like 10 minutes, it's, it's, they're going to talk about something. Sort of a cool, cool map. So if you're really interested in this subject, you're interested in what is going on in live, you know, today, uh, you go to this site and it's updated. Next slide. Okay, so questions. And first of all, before you ask questions, I want you to think yourselves. You're in these scenarios. You're in these situations. If you were, if you were in this, you know, you, I mean, if, it's, if something happened right now, somebody came in here and dropped chemical rage, what would you do? How would you respond? 
if you're a first responder, how do you think that they should respond? And then if you're the President of the United States, in all these scenarios, how would you have responded? There's no right answer. Absolutely no right answer. But, you know, that's, you know, I get frustrated with politics. I think we all get frustrated with politics, but it really plays a role. And, you, and, you know, it, it really is a decisive um, means of, you know, taking action. I, think. I mean, it's, it's part of the decision. Any other questions? Yes. How did they destroy the weapons on the ship offshore? Uh, so it's a two part. It's a chemical, chemical, big, uh, chemical process that they did. So, I, you know, whatever I've given this pres this like two times, and usually, the the it's sort of a depressing presentation, and I truly apologize for it. I really do. I mean, it's horrible, but it's it's the reality of what happened, and I, you know, I wanted to to present at least show you what we were doing, at least some of the interactions I was doing. Um, you know, with regard to treating those casualties, the United States military has, they call them auto injectors, and it's a, uh, it's a mixture of uh, two PAM, uh, two pralidoxine chloride and, and atropine. It's, it's a um, anticholinergic agent. So um, what, what you do is you inject it into you and it's supposed to stop all the, the, you know, the toxic effects, essentially. Uh, you can, we give three of those. Every soldier here has three of them. But in these scenarios where these people are dying of gas, the best thing to do is to give atropine, as much atropine as you can, to stop the convulsions as quickly as you can. And then the 2-PAM, what 2-PAM does, the cholinesterase binds to, I mean, the nerve agent binds to acetylcholinesterase. Acetylcholinesterase breaks down your acetylcholine. So in your, when your nerve fires, it releases acetylcholine. And if you don't break it down, it'll keep on firing, twitching and everything. Right? What's it? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, and it, it causes secret. So it causes your lungs to tighten so you can't breathe. And it causes secretion of fluids into it. So your lungs fill up with water and you essentially drown. So it's horrible. So um, the 2-PAM takes that nerve agent off the acetylcholinesterase, enables that then to break down the acetylcholine. But quite honestly, the best thing you want to do, atropinize them. Give them as much atropine as possible. So, yes? For the exposure to this nerve gas, are there any time frames or concentrations? And also, this mask, which sometimes you see some people are wearing, are they really protecting? Okay, very good. That's, that's the next question. The masks, not only, so are the masks protective that they're wearing? They're wearing surgical masks. They're wearing surgical gloves. No, absolutely not. That is, it's not protective. They, clothing, that, I mean, most people are relatively modest. The best thing you want to do is remove all your clothes. Um, you want to, they have, you see people, I'm not sure that if you notice in the videos, they had people taking a water bottle, like dressed like me, and pouring water over these casualties in a closed room like this. You know, they bring them into this room and they're pouring water on them. Well, the problem with that, first of all, they're not dressed properly. So a lot of the medical staff or, or the, the responders end up getting injured themselves. So several of them died. Um, and you don't want to do that in a closed room either because where's it going? You know, you're pouring water in, well, it's going out on the floor. It's not kill, destroying it. You want to decontaminate them outside. You want to remove all their clothes so there's nothing that's still staying on the clothes itself. And, um, and you'd like to protect yourself better. You, you, you don't, the regular mask, you want like a carbon filter type mask if you could. Uh, yes? Uh, again, thank you for the talk. I just have a question. Like during your study and whatever you see uh, during the years, do you think that uh, the first responder in Syria 
uh, did a good job. Do you think that, because I know that we're, when we have an incident, chemical incidents, the best thing is the first responder is the most important thing. Yes. And there's incident command management. Uh, did the United States train these people how to deal with the incident command management, how to deal with the chemical uh, incident? Do you think that these people, the medical uh, uh, crew, uh, and was able to treat these people, to help these people correctly and with the, with the, the proper equipment and the treatment, especially like the kids that you mentioned. Do you think that Syria, with all these portions during the war, because the, the situation started as an under Arab uh, spring phenomenon, right. and after that, there was two parts, and after that, everything pulled apart. Every, uh, Group want to take the power, they don't care about the people, they just fight each other. So, in, in this situation, when you have a war in this country, I don't think there's a lot of organization inside the country or the medical, let's say, the medical uh, institution care about this anymore. They care about maybe just to be safe or just to treat the people for war. But chemical incidents, you know, it's like, I think it's more. Uh, more than they, they can do. So did the United States treat them? Did the United States uh, teach them how to do this? Stuff? So the question for the, for the uh, camera that is, did two, two, two parts and maybe three or four, <laughs> if I can show you this. <laughs> One is, did the first responders respond properly? Second is, did the United States treat them? And again, recognizing when this first occurred, we were not friends with Syria, right? The government of Syria did not like the United States, and we didn't necessarily like them. So for us to have trained them earlier, we do have a course that we offer that trains, we, we train numerous countries, the United States does, and we offer them to come and show them how to do that. Um, we did not, I, I do not believe we trained anybody from Syrian government. Now the war occurs. You know, there's numerous facts, as you say, there's numerous groups out there. Um, how do you train them to respond? Well, I don't know exactly everything that occurred. I, I can t speak specifically for my part. Uh, they did call me, uh, the Physicians for Human Rights called me up and they took the manuals that United States developed on how to best uh, handle these situations, translated into their language, and then um, sent that over there to the physicians. You know, there's, it's not, a, they're at war. It's not easy just to, to go to the hospital and say, okay, we're gonna have training to everybody, you know? It's, you have to find people that have the capability to understand and be able to do it, and then, you know, do that. So, hey, did we have a part? Yes, we had a part. Could it, could have been better? I mean, it's war. Things happen at war that are just horrible. It's, so there's always a, a better way to do things. I, I mean, not under the governmental like uh, power, not like right. the United States government are involved in that. I mean, at least under non-profit uh, organizations, yes. uh, like the UN or the WHO, you can like get yeah. inside more. The, the UN, the UN was was um, trying to get involved, but they did not. They really did not get involved as much. I mean, everybody has their own opinion. Okay, <laughs> I tell you my opinion, right? Uh, for Wisworth, I don't think that the UN was involved as much as they should have been. I think it was really, you know, it was the United States, uh, Britain, and France were really the primary people in, in, involved. So you yeah. Have yeah. yeah, no, so that's, okay. I like that question, and, and here's what, you know, if you write a paper yourself, and you give it somebody to, to fix, and they make a lot of suggestions, you understand that much more than if they just give you a paper at first and you read it. So if I give you my simple answer, then you don't think about it as much yourself. I, I'm not going to answer that <laughs> because I want you to think about that. There's no right or wrong. There really isn't. And it, you know, the, the war trust, today we can say, gosh, we should have jumped in there. Can you imagine if we, before any incident occurred, we went in there and just you know, destroyed all sites that we thought were chemical warfare agents. Well, you see what the government done, how they twisted things. 
we would never have seen the horrible atrocities from chemical warfare, but you would have seen how the United States destroyed parts of the country. And we would have, we would have looked bad, although, you know, you, perhaps we may have avoided that. You just don't know at the time. Yes. Now, your experience, you know, uh, affected this, like, reaction for the Syrian war. Like, the experience in Iraq, we, we know that you are involved in Iraq war. Right. Do you think that, I guess it's a bad experience for us because they lost a lot of money, soldiers, stuff like that. Do you know, do you think that this, that experience affected the president's decision? Absolutely. There's no, there is absolutely no question our, part of our reason we did not get involved is because of the American people's uh, involvement with the Iraq war and we're ready, we want to get out of there. We, you know, and, and we, we're not seen favorably, you know, you, you go in and you, if you try to help and you're not seen favorably, why are we doing this? Yes, ma'am. So I, I really like the way you made it interesting such a complex matter because there are so many variables in this equation. So that reminds me a lot how cells function. For example, how does a cell regulate the age? Uh, I love this. <laughs> Let's put it at the, this level. Yes. For example, yeah. and when you have good, good, good guys who say that the cell is running, and we have the bad guys, like free radicals, the calcium, which is a day of replication, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So you have many variables. Well, right. So there are models that have been developed taking into account factors that are known and factors that are unknown, but they can be predicted by the model. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, in a situation like this, are there any models done to find the most accurate answer for the situation? Are there any models <coughs> that are doing this? So the question is, um, very complex situations, very similar to a cell. You know, and the, and the cell has so many different responses to different, different events, really. Um, and we tried to model a cell and see how it would respond to, to certain events, example, right? change the pH, if right. the, the pH is acid, yeah. the, the model tells you what to do to bring it back to 7.4. Right, right. And so her question is, do we have any models about of, of these scenarios. Um, not that I really know. I think it's, it's more in, intuitive that, you know, people think they know. It's, it's this where all the intel comes in and they, uh, they think they know how people are going to respond. But in war, you just really don't know what the heck's going to happen. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you very much for a fascinating lecture. Very informative and how you you, you know, took us through a timeline of a very complex situation. Um, so my question is, with the, do you see a need for more research into nerve agents? And are, is the NIH and other de Department of Defense, are they actually pushing for more research in this area? Okay, so that's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, and that is, I didn't, I didn't pay him to say this, but that's right up my alley. If anybody would ask a question, that's it, okay. His question is, uh, should we do more research in chemical warfare agents, and not just the military, but NIH? And uh, coincidentally, the, uh, the NIH and the military are linked very together. I, I mean, it, it just so happens that my one buddy was a big shot at NIH when I was commander at the Institute of Chemical Defense we got together and we actually end up forming a relationship where we are working together as part of that. Were you, were you funded on the NIH or uh, no, military? No, I was funded yeah. under DARPA. Okay. And we were in okay. a situation where we could not move our stuff out to the goat farm and average the exposure we had to do here. Is that right? We, just, we, we had too many things going on. Oh, okay. So yeah, I think it, it's a very valid question. I think we should look at you know, nerve agent, I mean, we should, not nerve agent, we should look at chemical warfare agent research. And um, one of the things that I ended up doing when I was at the Institute of Chemical Defense was convince the uh, government to build a state-of-the-art facility at Aberdeen Proving Ground for the military to, to investigate this much more thoroughly. 
So we have, if, if anybody is interested, they do have civilian positions in, in contract government, I mean, um, postdoc positions there, that you could go work there and try to develop antidotes. We, the military, the United States stance, and you know, people say, oh yeah, that, that's not, they, we don't know really what they're doing. I'm telling you, we do not do offensive chem warfare agent efforts here in the United States. We, we used to, you know, back in World War I and World War II when things were crazy, we do not do offensive research. Our efforts, we is 100% defense. So we're looking at ways to mitigate the negative effects of, of uh, chemical warfare agents. So um, with that, you know, we're, it's, you know, it's sort of hard to, I mean, imagine with the, just a gun. Somebody can shoot you at any time. You, we can come up with ways to protect yourself. Uh, you know, you wear a vest and that, but I mean, how many of you have a vest on now, right? A pool-proof vest. You go outside and get shot. Yeah, I'm not going and, to Right? <laughs> huh? And, yeah, really you know, seriously, the chemical warfare, anybody can, it's a small amount can kill you. Anybody can use it. It's very hard to truly protect. So you're, you're a reactionary. Most of the time, you know, it's trying to address a situation like this. Um, and that's, you know, that's what, that paper that I showed you, my buddy, Eric uh, Eisenkafrit, he talked about in a, in a response situation that you don't bring them into a confined room, you, you decontaminate them outside. It'd be better if you had soapy water. Um, you definitely don't want to use your hands. I mean, are those gloves protected? No but they're better than nothing if that's all you have. Uh, does the mask protect? Quite, quite honestly, the masks are probably just a waste of time. I, I wouldn't even put the mask on, because uh, the gas is going to go through that. Um, but I probably, if, if that's all I had, if I had gloves, I probably would put those gloves on and try to decontaminate people. Um, so one more question, Dr. Yeah. Salisbury's been waiting patiently, and then we'll okay. have to wrap. Yeah. Fantastic talk. Thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, but just one uh, kind of quick question that also ties in the, the first responder. Um, um, years being in, in the fire service um, in this country, right? I mean, first responders primarily are going to be the fire service. Um, and so I guess my question is, for first responders um, in, in the U.S., do they have two pan chloride as far as their dope yet or no? I don't know if they have two PAM. That's a, that's a good question. I know they have atropine. Yeah, well, yeah, 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 and yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah. I'm on the Calor Calorex study section in the interpetive, where we are actually is designed to develop drugs counter agents for any of the chemical warfare agents. Uh, at one of the meetings, somebody did say that in Baltimore they do have kits on board for first responders. I kind of don't think that's true, but they do have bedazzling and uh, it's kind of dumb. Bedazzling can do for an attribute. So, uh, but that's the idea. Right. There is nothing. We don't have Mark 1 kids. We don't have right. anything for civilians. And that's what NIH is trying to answer is the civilian problem right now. Yes. The reality is they are going to be the ones that are first on the So I mean, I can't really fault any of the first responders on site here because even if they want half the training, right, you know, that, that they are civilians and they're responding to a horrific event and they're yes. responding to save lives. Exactly. And unfortunately, sometimes more life is lost in that type of event or sometimes it's better just to shut the door and walk away. Yeah. And that's a hard decision, but it's, it's you know, shelter in place. Um, just real quick, he mentioned midazolam. Midazolam, um, very similar to diazepam. Diazepam and midazolam stop the convulsions. Yes. So, and that's why they did that. So when he referenced that, I didn't talk about that, but that's what the purpose of that is. So Dr. Lugu, while this will not help oh, who, uh, chemical defense, it will give you some gravitas when you're out there speaking about it, it because we are the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, um, All right, appreciate it. Good job. <laughs> All right. We need a picture oh. with the shirt. Oh. All right.